I actually feel like people who are very appreciative to you for a lot that you could get out of me. So,
sometimes I think, you know, oh, the devil's in these sound system things because everything seems to go wrong together on the same day. But that's okay. The devil didn't know I was going to pick up an extra battery just in case. So. As we begin our time of worship this morning, I want to invite you to stand with me as we say these scriptures together out of Psalm 63. Would you say it with me? Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and dreary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than mine, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Let's remain standing as we begin to sing. One, two. Um, 
we decided that we would do a little bit of a, a time of prayer today in our worship service. As we look towards the future, as we look towards um, finding this um, new pastor, um, we also have to be prepared ourselves. We have to be ready and willing um, to be uh, led. And as, as JC was talking last week about uh, following, following Christ, and Jesus said to follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And um, anyways, as, as Carrie was sharing her heart uh, about what she felt like God had laid on her heart, it, it was evident that we just need to spend some time as, as individuals and as a church just um, praying and allowing um, the Lord to speak into our hearts and show us what it is that His will is for us. If we can all get on the same page and that would be His page, um, then we can um, find the hope and the future that He promises when we seek Him and seek Him with all our hearts. So we're going to start off with this song, Speak, O Lord. And then after that, um, there's going to be some prompts on the screen that just allow us to spend some time in prayer. And it's not going to be a hurried time. It's not going to be a rushed time. It's just going to be you and the Lord. Um, I've been reminded of the, the people of Israel and how they were getting ready to go into the promised land. And there was that one person that hid some of the spoils in his tent. Um, the sin of Achan there at the Battle of Ai. So I, I want to encourage each of us to do business with the Lord, to get our hearts right, to allow Him to be Lord and God and the sovereign King over our hearts and also our church's life. Oh 
Heavenly Father, as you have come before us this morning, <clears throat> we've gathered here in your name. Thank you for your word that reminds us that you're an almighty God, that you're a faithful God, that you are the Heavenly Father who loves us as you bestow grace upon us. Thank you for reminding us that we are wrong. Thank you for reminding us that we're sinful. And Lord, I, I just this morning would ask that you would remind us that as a follower of Jesus Christ, it really costs us everything and everything that we have our family our homes the church friends financial resources a job none of that belongs to us it all belongs to you And Father, may we remember that as we look ahead in these days, the rest of this day and the days coming, that we are to come to you as we have done in this short time of meditation, reflection, and prayer. That we're to come to you every day, not once, not twice, maybe three or four times a day, whatever is sufficient for you to be able to lead us. Whatever is sufficient to help us understand our responsibility as a disciple to follow. Lord, sometimes we have to be in the head three and four times just to remember who we are. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to you. So that I'm praying this morning that you would help us look at the cost of truly being your disciple. And maybe we ask ourselves a question as we think about your work and reflect. Are we truly being your disciple? Are we truly following you? Oh Lord, that we should not pass through this life with our own way, our own thoughts, claim that our life does demonstrate our commitment to follow you. Now we can take our time this morning together as we look at your word. Help us understand what Jesus was saying <clears throat> to the people that were trying to follow him. And Lord, I pray as a church that we might sit at your feet and follow you. Lord, <clears throat> we pray this time and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to Matthew chapter 14. Most of us were not involved in World War II. I said most of us. One of the greatest theologians, really, and preachers of the World War II time and era was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Has anybody heard of that name before? Dietrich Bonhoeffer is someone you should read his life story. He stood for Christ. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, salvation is free. But discipleship will cost you your life. That truly is what happened with him. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he went on to say this. The disciple must say to himself the same words that Peter said to Christ. And that is when he denied him, when Peter denied Christ, he says, I don't know this man. We need to be able to say to ourselves that we don't know this man either because we're Christ. We're not ourselves. We don't live for ourselves. And self-denial is, when we're talking about the cost of discipleship, self-denial is not a series of isolated events uh, suppressing our, our, our bodily desires or, or it, it's not a severe discipline to avoid uh, all the things that, that come in this life. It is not suicide, but there is an element of self-will self even in that. I have to deny myself only to be aware of Christ. 
and no more of self, to see him who goes before, no, no more road, which is too hard for us. Once more, all that self-denial can say is that Jesus leads the way, and I need to follow him. So following him is crucial in the life in which we live, especially if others want to be, if we want others to be influenced. You have to count the cost for following Jesus. Now, let me read his words, and would you stand as we honor him today in the reading of God's word and in Matthew or Luke chapter 14, starting verse 25. Jesus says some things that are so shocking that the people who are following him say, wait a minute. I don't agree with you. We didn't hear that, but I could hear it. I could hear the crowd saying this. And what were those disturbing words? The Greek word is miso. Miso. The word hate is miso. Now here's what Jesus said. Now the great crowds were traveling with him, so he turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me and does not miso, hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even if you don't hate your own life, you cannot be my disciple. I want to tell you folks, that's strong words. Matter of fact, sometimes you think those are terrible words. Why would Jesus say you have to hate your family? And this as well as passages, people sometimes say, well, if that's who Jesus is, I'm just not going to even be involved with him. You have to go further than that. And then what he says in verse 20, again, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me, cannot be my disciple. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? Otherwise, verse 29 says, otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and he can't finish it, all the onlookers will begin to make fun of him, saying, this man started a bill, but he wasn't able to finish. Pretty serious stuff. And 31, or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he's able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. In verse 33, he says this, in the same way, therefore, every one of you who does not say goodbye to all his possessions, you cannot be my disciple. Strong words, very strong words. And then verse 34, he adds a little bit more to this with salt. How many of you like salt on your hamburger? How many of you like salt? And the doctor says, quit using this salt. You understand what I'm saying? Verse 34, now salt is good, but if salt shall lose its taste, how will it be salty? And the next statement, I think, gross, 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 gross. It isn't fit for the soil or the manure pile. In farming, I stood in a lot of manure piles. And I've thought about this many times. And Jesus said, salt's not even fit for the manure pile. He said, maybe the manure pile's better than the salt. Oh, my gosh. Now, before you make that conclusion, just hang with me, all right? They throw it out, and anyone who has ears to hear should listen. Miso, hate, hate, hate your wife, hate your spouse, hate, hate your family, hate your friends, hate the church. Jesus was saying a cost of discipleship means that much. And what was he saying? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Let's pray. Father, again, we want to come before you and say thank you for what your word has to say. Following Jesus definitely means we have to count the cost. The cost, Father, is really sweet. Father, we uh, thank you for it. Now, would you teach us from your word this morning? It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Would you be seated? I don't know when Annie Dillard wrote her book, but she wrote a book, An Expedition to the Pole, and it describes the ill-fated Franklin Expedition. Do you all know about the Franklin Expedition? You know what happened with them? Does anybody know who the, you know anything about the Franklin Expedition? Anybody here? My goodness, you all are not students of history, are you? The, the uh, Franklin Expedition perished because its preparations were not adaptable to the direction they were headed. It was the Royal Navy 
And uh, they had an officer's club in England. And so they weren't about to adapt to the harsh realities of the Arctic. They hadn't been there, didn't know what they were getting into. So they had, in 1845, Sir John Franklin had 138 officers and men. They embarked from England to find a Northwest Passage across the high Canadian Arctic to the Pacific Ocean. They sailed in two three-mast ships. In other words, these two ships had a mast here and a mast here and a little one in the back. So they, they called them the three-mast ships. Each vessel had a steam engine and a 12-day supply of coal. That's all. They projected that for the entire two to three years voyage. Somebody in their math or somebody in their thinking is absolutely dumb to think that way. Instead of additional coal, here's what they did. They made each ship room large enough to hold a 1,200 volume library. They put in a hand organ and they play, that played 50 tunes. They put in china place settings for officers and men. They had cut glass wine goblets and sterling silver flatware and the officers sterling silver knife. As you mind, I'm going to the Arctic and all you take is this little jacket. What's wrong with you? I'm not getting on a boat with you if you decide to do that, that's for sure. The ship set sail and two months later, a British whaling captain met the two barks, uh, those of the boats in Lancaster Sound. And he, when he's on his way back in, he told them that the men's spirits were high. That was the last time anybody saw those men alive. Last time. They found a place that they later named Starvation Cove. There was one boat there. The remains of 35 men had been dragging it. And then at Terror Bay, and the Inuit, that was the Eskimos, found a tent on the ice and in it were 30 bodies. At Simpson Strait, some of the Inuits had a very odd sight. There was a pack ice pierced by three protruding wooden masks in a bark. That was the boat. For 20 years, search parties recovered skeletons from all over the frozen sea. These men, whoever was leading them, did not count the cost. Those 138 men of John Franklin perished because they underestimated the requirements of an Arctic exploration. And you might say, well, that's easy to see. We would know better than that. Yet, sometimes we, life as we live it, is like an expedition. But when we live it without Christ leading, we're going to fail. In Luke 14 and 24 and 35, Jesus was set on going to Jerusalem where he had determined he was going to die. But he had all these people following one of his to be disciples. And so he made those, those statements that just sound horrible out there. But they're having this holiday feast. He gave them this reality check. The whole passage is the, the, the grand unity consisting of a brief introduction, two parallel sayings on discipleship, two parabolic sayings, and a memorable conclusion. And Jesus did this for his followers. But John Franklin didn't do that for his followers. He didn't tell them what they were about to bark on. So what is the cost of discipleship? The relational cost, and that's the first aspect of this. What's the relational cost of following Jesus? And you all think with me on this because I struggle with this as well. It's a shocker to hear Jesus say, if anyone comes to me and does not me so hate his father and mother, his wife and children, brothers and sisters, his own life, he can't be my disciple. So when I hear that, I think about that terrible thought of how could that be? Jesus often states a principle in a startling way so that the hearers will wake up and listen to what he's really trying to say. Jesus wanted the listeners to think. Now, in, in light of the, the New Testament, Jesus was not demanding an unqualified hatred. That's not what he was saying. How could Jesus command you honor your father and mother and then demand that you also hate them? How could he say that? How could he command husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave him up for her and then and advise them to hate their spouses? How could he do that? That doesn't make any sense to me. Jesus, who also loved little children, and he took the children in his arms and he put them in his hands and he blessed them. How could he advise your parents to hate your children? Does this make sense to you? 
the miso command. Neither could he advise his followers to be reconciled to a brother and then encourage them, hate your brother. That's contrary to what he says in Matthew about when you have a problem, go to a brother and get it taken care of. It's contrary to love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul. And it's contrary to the second commandment. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. That just, it just doesn't make sense. Are you confused? It's all right to say yes. The truth is, in the biblically recommended sense, we're to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're to love one another as Christ has loved us. We can be devoted to our family too much, but we can't love them too much. So in the final clause, Jesus recommended that each of the followers hate him his own life. Jesus could not be recommending a psychologically destructive existence. That's not what he was doing. In a paradox, Jesus was saying that our love for him must be so great and so pervasive that our natural love of self and family pales in comparison. I love Jesus more than anything, was what he's saying. Do you love Jesus today more than anything? And before you say yes, I want you to evaluate your life before him today. Not me, but for what, but what his scripture says. Do you love Jesus more than anything? And if you say yes, I'm going to say, do you love Jesus more than you love the Chiefs? Because they're playing this afternoon. And some of you can't wait to see that game. Bless your hearts. Somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. They'll do the same thing again next year. If your life is surrounded by a sports event and you hang on that and you mope for two weeks if they don't win or three months, I don't think you're very devoted to Jesus because my life is not dependent on whether the Chiefs win or lose. I'd like to see them win, but that's not the way I live my life. Where are you in regard to that? With that harsh statement, Jesus really tries to pull us out of the world in which we live to say, think about this. Think about your life, where you are, and how you're living. R.K. Hughes says this, this is where so many of us fall short in the secularized anti-family culture of today. Because our families are at the center of our Christian ethic. We're supposed to love our families and care for our families, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to do? That's what the scripture says. And, and that's proper. I think we ought to do that. But some of us love our wife or husband or children more than we love God. We miss the mark when we put their development athletically, intellectually, and culturally, and artistically, and socially before their spiritual well-being. I've heard parents saying, I want my kid to be this. I want my kid to be this. I'm not. And when I say, well, what about the spiritual part of that life? Well, they can go to church. You know, they'll learn to go to church. They'll learn to read the Word of God. Listen, when you put the world ahead of your kids, you're just asking for trouble. Okay, are you with me? Are you awake? You can't put them socially, spiritually, in, in all the other things the world has to offer uh, uh, in front of their spirituality. We fall short. This is, this is an ouch statement for me. GK says this. We fall short when we spend more time in a car in one day shuttling them to games and lessons than we do in one month in prayer for their souls. Ouch. Are you with me now? Ouch. By comparison, our lives reveal that we hate God and love our children disproportionately and that we are not Jesus' disciples. What he's saying is, you've got a family I've given you, you've got a church I've given you, you've got brothers I've given you, but if you don't love me more than them, then you're, you're out of poor proportion to where I want you to be. Does that make sense? See, hate there, that means the word means that we're not necessarily to hate our family, but he wanted us to get the point that he was first and everything else is second. Wow. So how do you measure up there? So the paradox here is that the proper way for me to love my children and to love my wife is to hate them because our greater love for God will enable us or me to love them with a greater love. Listen, if I love God with all my heart, I'll love my children appropriately. I'll love my wife appropriately. If I love Jesus above the church, I'll love the church appropriately. You see, when you get everything in order... When you get it right and you make Jesus the center and the focus of your life, everything else falls into place. Because he helps you prioritize how you live your life to make sure that your family is cared for in Christ. He's going to make sure that everything else in the church comes out right. 
But if Jesus is not first in your life and you have preferences that you want to see happen, but it's not what Jesus desires, good luck. You're ill-prepared for the, the path that you're going to be walking down. You see, disciples are the best lovers of God and the end of family and of friends. And disciples are always ready to hate, to give second place to everything else and everyone else. A relational cost of discipleship seems harsh, but in the right perspective and priority, this focuses our lives and makes them richer and fuller. So the question that challenges me today and challenges you, how do we grow in our love for Christ so that it becomes passion? How do you love Jesus more than you love anything else? And I can tell you one simple way to do that, and that is to stay in the Word of God every day, that is to pray every day, and, and make Jesus the focus of your attention daily. And how do you do that? Well, today, after, after we conclude the service, you're going to have the opportunity to get involved with the whole church and reading the Bible through starting the first Sunday in February. Now, what does that mean? I got a schedule for you. I got a place for you to sign up. We have facilitators who are going to help you in D groups. They're going to meet on Sunday night. There's more of that to come, but I want to tell you, it'll be the greatest experience of your life. Be involved in the Word of God every day, all week long. And then when you come together to discuss what Jesus said, the cool thing about this is in the D groups, when they come back together and they've been studying all week and what God has to say to them, they come to church with expectancy and say, Guess what I learned in the Word of God this week? Guess what I learned this week? Instead of, well, I wonder if the Chief's going to win today. I wonder what's going to happen. Instead of the world, it's about Jesus, not the world. Isn't that, wouldn't that be wonderful? That if every person was coming with that idea, well, let's, let's talk about what Jesus has done in our life. So you have this relational cost that Jesus was talking about, the relational cost to be a disciple. He modeled that on earth by spending time with his heavenly Father. He was busy every day, but he never neglected the time to be alone with his Heavenly Father. So here's the deal. Time with our Heavenly Father results in changed thinking and changed behavior. If God changes your thinking, he changes your behavior as well. It just follows suit. Wow. Now, that's one thing, relational cost. What about the sacrificial cost? Jesus then cited the vast relational uh, Calvary cost of discipleship. And he used this word. If anyone does not carry his, what's the word? If he doesn't carry his what? His cross. And follow he, me, he cannot be my disciple. Now, you know the cross in Jesus' day was used as an instrument of death. People that were nailed to the cross were considered crooked, bad, evil, and all that kind of stuff. And Rome had crosses along the roads coming into Rome, and there were, there were people on crosses hung upside down, some of them right side up. They were hung there. They were to rot and die. It was an instrument for death. That's what it was, an instrument of execution. He's saying, in, in an effect, what are instruments of execution used in our world today? Anybody know? Don't hear it that often, but the electric chair. Death by hanging? Death by somebody shooting somebody? What Jesus is saying here when he talks about carrying his cross, discipleship is really a series of deaths. Perpetual dying. We have to learn how to die to Christ every day. It's self-denial. Disciples embrace suffering as a part of life. Paul prayed, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sharing and his sufferings becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul was interested in dying every day so that Jesus could reign in his life. Now, why is that important? Because our life, our possessions, our family, and everything else reigns in our life if Jesus doesn't reign in our life. See, a disciple's life is not easy. C.S. Lewis, have you ever heard of C.S. Lewis? And he has some interesting readings. He said this, the Christian way is different. Christ says, give me all. I don't want uh, so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. He doesn't want that. He says, I want you. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, 
but I've come to kill it, your natural self. The natural self is that desire that says, I want, I want, I want. Christ wants that eliminated. He wants you to say, above all things, Jesus, you're first. Not what I want, but what do you want? It's tough when we think about it in those terms. No halfway measures are any good. I need to hand over my whole natural self. I need to hand all over my desires. And some of the things I think are innocent as well. And the ones that I think are wicked, whatever those are, the, the whole thing. Christ, when I bring it, I, you got the whole thing. You got me. I'm just a sinner. But you got me. I give my whole life to you. Have you given your whole life, your whole being to Jesus? Are there some things you've reserved and kept and hold on to because it's your, oh, I hate this word, preference to keep it? It's my choice. No, it's not your choice. If you claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ's disciple, you don't own anything. God owns it all. He owns all of you. See, discipleship requires everything. There's aren't exceptions. No one has ever come to be a disciple of Christ and lived a life of ease. It's just not possible. If you go back and look <coughs> at the apostolic church, you won't find any exceptions there. You can check all the writings and personal visionettes during the first 400 years of the church, and you'll not find one disciple that lounged on a bed and had constant comfort. You won't find that. Every one of them had cost involved in their life. And the same is true of the Dark Ages and the Renaissance and the Reformation and 500 years of intervening history. Discipleship always calls for us to sacrifice, give of ourselves. The coolest thing about that is, I can't say I've reached that. I can't say I'm 100% there. But I keep trying to give more and more of my life to Christ. But as I do that, God brings this sense of peace in my heart that I can't explain to anybody except that it's just, I know I'm okay. Everybody else can look at me and say, you're weird. I say, you're right, I'm weird, but Jesus thinks I'm okay. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible, his word tells me so. Listen, no matter how weird you are, no matter how crazy you are, no matter what you think you look like or what you think others think you look like, God says, I value you. Isn't that great, Steve? Aren't you glad that God values Steve? I am. Sorry to pick on your brother. But, but the discomfort, some great things emerge. They're, they're the challenges to pay the relational cost and to hate our closest relationship, the miso, and that is to love God above those, to pay the sacrificial cost, uh, to, to have those things killed in our life that would keep us from following Jesus, begins to create this new disciple, a man or a woman, who is sharp, who's salty, and brings a flavor to life, and everybody gets to benefit, not the least of, which is his family that benefits from his saltiness. And oh, it's beautiful. So, how do you calculate? There was relational, there was sacrificial. How do you calculate what the cost of discipleship is? How do you do that? Remember, our friend that we said in the first example, and his 130 men, they didn't calculate the cost, and it cost them their life. But how do you calculate the cost? So, Jesus used this twin parables of the tower of war to encourage his followers to count the cost. He says this in the scripture, suppose one of you wants to build a tower, will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king, will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Those parables make essentially the same point, but there's a slight different inferences, emphasis there. The builder of the tower is free to build or not as he chose. The king was being invaded, he had to make a quick choice. But both of the parables emphasize the necessity of careful calculation. Calculate, calculate, sit down, take some time, com compute it all out, think about it. And there was a Franklin expedition that went crazy. Their failure was noted in, in the not calculating the cost.
Every accomplishment in life requires you to count the cost. Yahshua Heifetz. Does anybody know who Yahshua Heifetz is? You do. Brian knows, because I accidentally mailed him that question last night. And I didn't mean to, but I did. Yahshua Heifetz, at age 75, had logged 102,000 hours of practice on a violin. He was a great violinist. Do you remember that Leonardo da Vinci and all the drawings and things he did, that, that he, was, he was great at what he did. On one occasion, he drew a thousand hands to try to get the, the, the depiction right on the ceiling. A thousand hands he drew. The Olympics is coming up. And how many times do you hear the stories of the Olympians who have spent years upon year upon year preparing to go to the Olympics? See, the, 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 the deal with these things are they calculated what the cost would be and then set the mind to it. And Jesus says that everybody that's going to be a disciple has to count the cost before you enter this, this life of becoming a disciple. And what's the cost? The cost is this. Every profession I have, everything that I am, every corner of my life, it all is something I have to give to the Lord. I don't own any of it. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, he cannot be my disciple. So here's the question that we have to keep coming back to and thinking, okay, relationally, I get it. I understand what it means relationally. And it's a big deal. But, but I have to look at this. What is it going to cost me? You know, when money or the things that, that money can buy makes us hesitant about doing what we feel the Lord is calling us to do, this is a tough statement. We are dis the disciples of things, not the disciple of Christ. Let me say it one more time. When money or the things that money can buy makes us hesitant about doing what we feel the Lord's calling us to do, we are the disciples of things and not of Christ. Ouch. 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 Would be disciples need to think about it when they say, Lord, all I have is yours. There's one test of discipleship. For sure. What are you doing with your money? Regardless of your income, whether it's little or a lot, we are to give regularly and generously, or we're not living as Christ's disciples. I've heard it said before if Christ has your pocketbook, he has your life. I think there's some truth to that. You see, you can't follow the Lord if you didn't have your heart. And Jesus said, not just your heart, but your treasure. You remember the scripture in Matthew 6, 21? Where your treasure is, Jesus said, there will your heart be also. So do you treasure Jesus more than life itself? Does he have your treasure? Then does he have your heart? Does, it, does such a life of sacrifice and single focus seem bland? I don't think so. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, finally imprisoned by the Nazis because he resisted the elimination of Jews. He was not himself a Jew, but he said, we cannot stand for this. We cannot do this. This is wrong. And he stood up against it, and his brothers tried to encourage him not to do this because, you know, you'll get in trouble if you do it. And he said, how can I be silent? I must stand up and proclaim this is wrong. And he did and he was imprisoned and then later hanged right before the end of war when they hung him. He gave his ultimate, he gave his life, but really his life wasn't his, it was Christ. When Jesus closed this section, he said, salt is good, but if it loses saltness, how can it be made salty again? Is it fit 
It is neither fit for the soil nor the manure pile is thrown out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 34, 35, salt, sodium chloride, it's a stable compound, but technically it can't lose its solidness, but it can be diluted in one mix with impurities, and it loses its saltiness. Well, there's a key there. We can't not be saved. We're always going to be saved, but when we mix our life with the world, we lose the saltiness that God wants us to have and the influence we want to have because we're living for the world instead of living for Jesus, who should be number one in our life. Oh, are you with me? See, the image of salt coming here on the heels of the three conditions of discipleship, hating one life and family, taking up the cross, and then giving everything, the expresses the willingness of disciples to give his life totally to Jesus Christ. Even as salt, it can lose its saltiness, so commitment to Christ <clears throat> can deteriorate. If the saltiness is lost, that disciple is useless and fit for nothing but to be tossed out. You don't lose your salvation, but there's no fruit. Here's what I conclude with. The disciple who is dynamically committed to Jesus in your respect to family, the cross, and money is going to be a powerful kingdom agent for Jesus Christ. His life could be delivered from the blandness of life. His presence is always felt. He seasons the life of his family and friends and church and society because he's committed to Christ first. His life brims, I think, with vitality. He brings zest and gusto to life like salt. Those disciples who follow Jesus bring out the best flavor of living that you'll ever experience. See, the cost of discipleship <clears throat> and the end result produces saltiness. And that saltiness flavors the whole world. And Jesus says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't know where you are in your life to Jesus. I don't know if he's really first to ask the question up front. How many of you love Jesus? How many are a, a disciple of Jesus based on what scripture says? Are you yet there in the discipleship following department? I'm still working on it, friends. But so should we all be. Because it changes us to make us better and sweeter than we've ever been before. The more you love Jesus, the sweeter and sweeter you should get. And the less and less contrary you should be. Don't you just love that? Y'all are sitting there speechless. Not because of me. <laughs> Jesus makes the difference in your life. So this morning, during our time of invitation, I want to ask you, have you counted the cost of serving Jesus? Do you love your family more than you love Jesus? If so, Jesus said, me so, you should hate your family. Love your first and let him. You know, the, the, the good thing about loving Jesus more than your family is he will help you to love your family that's sometimes very unlovely. That's the coolest thing. And that's just awesome. Because when you're letting Jesus love you and then love your family through you, there's no mistakes. It's just great. I love you. God loves you. I want to see you follow Jesus with all your heart. I want to see you be his disciple. I want you to count the cost. And God will change the church forever. So part of the invitation today is, will you do something about, remember, not in the relational part, but the second part I was talking about the fact that we spend more time with Jesus, that we spend time with our Heavenly Father. You can do that by making an equipment and say, I want to read through the Bible. There are some things down here, sheets, that will tell you how to read through the Bible for a whole year. We're not going to start until February the 6th. That's a week from today. And we'll talk more about that on February 6th. The D groups are going to meet on Sunday nights. You can be a part of following Jesus and loving him more and more and letting the world see how sweet you really are in Christ. That's your decision. If you want to come and join these groups, I'm not I'm telling you that you have to, but it, to, to spend more time with Jesus, sign your name down here on this little sheet of paper. Come and do something to see, make the world aware that Jesus is alive and he's living in you. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, today... I want to say thank you.
I thank you for this church. I thank you for the leadership of this church. I thank you that you're here. And I thank you that Jesus is here. And Lord, I'm praying this morning that people would make a commitment to reorder their life and to let them, Lord, that they might love you more than they love their family or, or love their spouse or love their children or love their friends. They might love you first. And in order to do that, when, you, when they follow you, when we all follow you, then you help us learn how to love others in the right way. Oh God, help us to do it this morning. Help us to make that commitment to spend more time with you on a daily basis. Whatever, Lord, you want people to do this morning, have them do it during this time of invitation. Maybe some need to come and profess Christ and say, I need Jesus, my Savior. Maybe there's some people visiting today that need to come and join this church. Whatever it is, Lord, help them to do it. And we commit this time to you. This invitation is in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Brian will be here at the front if you need to come talk to him. If you'd like to come and sign up and be a part of our experience of reading through the Bible this year, there's a place right here you can do it. Why don't you step out and make a commitment to Jesus today? Brian, let's sing.
you'll need to talk about what you learned during the week of reading through the Bible. It's an accountability way to keep you involved in the process. Listen, would you agree that there's not a better way to love Jesus more than reading his word and hearing from him every day? Would you agree with that? Then you ought to be involved in reading. Some of you didn't agree because you don't want to do it. I don't know. But listen, there's not a better way to be blessed in your life than to let Jesus reign and rule in your life from a loving standpoint. So, if you'd like to be a part of a group, there's one something you need to sign up right here. You can go to one of these and say, I'd like to be in your group. We're going to have about seven per group. Men with men, women with women. We have more men and more women, but the other leaders are not here right now. We'll probably be in the second service as well. So, I want you to consider doing that, be a part of that. If you'd like to know more about it, there is a, a brochure down here about Read Through Bible Plan. There's also Plan 101, which is what we're doing. And you can take one of those and read about it and understand what's happening. I just pray, church, you get serious about following Jesus. And this is one of those ways. Not that you're not, but this can, make, this can enrich your life. All right, brother, come and speak to us. Again, it's good to see you, whether you're here in person or online. If you're a guest, we are especially grateful to have you today. I'll be in the back with a love chance to get to know you a little bit better and, and give you a gift from our church. Again, uh, these D groups, these discipleship groups are starting next Sunday, February 6th at 5 p.m. here in the sanctuary. So I encourage you guys to sign up and get involved in that. This coming Thursday is our next men's ministry event. If you're a boy or a man, no matter what your age is, I encourage you to come find a friend, a, a person to invite to that. That will be this Thursday, at, uh, February 3rd at 6.30. Uh, it's going to be a chili cook-off, so you can bring your own chili and, and have it uh, have it tested, and and um, and um, and the winner of that will be receive a fifty dollar gift certificate to Blue Silo Beef in Ashgrove. So it's a good opportunity to come and bring a friend and fellowship. So I encourage you if you're a uh, mail that, that to come to that and then also as hard as it is to believe it's already garage sale time this coming April and so if you have stuff that you want to get rid of that we can sell that all proceeds from that go to support our mission trip that will be going on this summer so if you need things picked up I'll be more than happy to come pick them up but if you want to bring stuff just let me know and I'll I'll get with you and figure out a place to to put it so um, we, if you have an offering or visitor card, you can drop that in the basket in the back of the sanctuary um, as you leave. And Lynn Woodall is going to come lead. Okay, Ralph. Ralph will come lead our offertory and closing prayer. I didn't see Lynn. Father, thank you, Lynn, for many blessings. Thank you for this day. Just be with us, Lord. Be with those that are unable to be with us, Father. We have many of us that are ill among us, but you just know them and just. Ask you to bless them. Now, Father, we just have you to bless us all to continue to do, to do the, what you have us to do, Father. Now, just dismiss us with your blessing. We ask in your son's name. Amen.